everyone, Sebastian here from Green Music Productions. It's an exciting day because Cubase 13 just came out. And as usual, I'm doing my in-depth overview of all the new features. I try to give you as much details and tips as possible. So if you like that kind of content, please click the like button. And if you don't want to miss out on future Cubase videos, please consider subscribing if you're not a subscriber. Now let's dive right in. So right off the bat, if I undock this window and I move it around, there are no more white bar lingering on top. If I shut down Cubase, it's the same thing. If I open the mix console, these are all contained windows. This is a lot snappier. I really like that. I hated that lingering white menu bar on top. So they changed that, they redesigned it and all the windows feel a lot better now. Uh, this is a great start. And the elephant in the room, you probably noticed it. There's a channel zone here on the left. It, they kept the inspector uh, because the channel zone, uh, the main goal of it is to make it familiar and always have uh, the same information listed in the channel zone, just like you have in the mix console. So all the channels that you see in the mix console, you can find the same components right there. Let's say you click on the pop-up EQ, it's the same that you have in the mix console, but now they also added the pre sections So you also have the I cut and low cut. So it's now a six band EQ, which is great. It's super easy to tweak it. Um, I use it all the time in the mix console and it's now right there. And if you don't like what you see, you can always right click in an empty field and click on setup section where you can just select, let's say I don't want the uh, strip section or I don't want the pre, you can disable them. Uh, the same goes for the inspector, uh, but just to give you an idea, in the inspector, when you select an audio channel, you can see that the different components change compared to, let's say, an instrument where you have no expressions and a bunch of different things. That's what's so great about the channel zone is that it always stays the same. It always focus on what you can see in the mix console usually. So you have the typical EQ routing, insert, sends, uh, the strip. So it's really great for that. As I was saying, you can now also customize the inspector window by right clicking in an empty field, clicking on setup sections, and you can enable and disable what you don't like. So let's say the fader, we also have it here, but let me just remind you what it looked like when you had it in the inspector. It's so ugly. It's so much better now with the channel zone. So I can hide that as soon as I can. <laughs> And one cool thing is um, you can make it super small if you want it to be there to always have your fader with your inserts and sends and the pop-up EQ, you can make it really small. You can also resize the inspector, but it doesn't get as small. If you don't like it, you click on that top right uh, icon right there. You could disable it. The same goes for the left zone with the inspector. Now, speaking of the mix console, as you can see, they, they redesigned uh, the layout a bit. Everything is a bit more clean. I, th I believe it's easier to read the different numbers as well. So the faders are crispier. Uh, the buttons look better as well. And one really good thing that they added, and again, it's the same in the channel zone, is the strip section. It used to be really ugly. Let's say you opened the gate, um, you had a big section right there and you had to scroll to see all the options. Now, if you enable it, you click on it and there's a pop-up window. It's super clean and easy to use. The same goes for all the modules. You can always move them around if you want a different order. And if you prefer the old way of doing it, you can right click on it and go under show strip module and go back to the old version of it. And now when you expand it, it's the old version. But in my opinion, the new layout is a lot better. To have them as pop-up is great. And you can always change the different device by clicking the little arrow. I think this is way cleaner. Now, the next feature I want to talk about is a redesign of the chord pads section. As you can see, there's now an upper portion right there. Everything is cleaner and you have a right section and you can resize it if you want. So let's uh, talk about this section to start with. You can select the root key. You can select the chord pad preset browser. So 
Uh, if you don't know what chord pads are, you can easily set different chords to different pads, assign them to your MIDI controller, for example, and trigger the chords with one note. You can drag and drop them right into your project if you want. So these presets comes with a bunch of uh, different chords patterns uh, that are popular that sound good. So if you're looking for a good inspiration source for a new track, this is really good. Uh, you can browse them through here, quickly save them. You can decide if you want voicing to be as a piano player or a guitar player. Uh, you can select chords, patterns, or sections. So if I select piano chords and I press those, they just play straightforward chords. If I select pattern, we now have a bunch of different presets for patterns, and if I play it, Right off the bat, this sounds like a good song. Like this is super helpful to help you compose new tracks. And if I want, again, I can select different patterns. It comes with a ton of different presets. So uh, you can get some really quick inspiration through it. So yeah, we have import from MIDI loop if we want. We can snap playback to musical grid. We can tweak the velocity of the different pads. We can select all the pads if we want to tweak them all at once. So to tweak a chord, you can either like double click on it, have this pop-up window, or use the right section that you can always disable by clicking here if you want, and quickly select, let's say C minor seven. Just like that, I tweak this chord. And the beautiful thing is you can switch to chord suggestions. So it will suggest different chords according to what you already have, or the circle of fifth, if that's what you like. Really useful stuff. You can also assign a MIDI input if you want. So you can play, let's say, a chord on your MIDI controller to assign it to different pads. You can quickly delete them, just like that. And all the um, transpose and tension and voicing options are now over here, but they also added some modifier to quickly change them. So let's say this A minor, I would like to use the transposition to change to change it, uh, it's super easy to do. But if you hover it, it says that by default, it's assigned to shift and mouse wheel. So I can just easily hover the right pad, click the shift button and use the mouse wheel to quickly change it. So it's faster than ever to tweak those. I can also change the tension with this arrow. And again, we have a modifier, which is alt this time using the mouse wheel again. great stuff. Uh, we also have different voicings. So if I change the voicing, we can see it at the bottom on the keyboard, or I can just use the, the mouse wheel. I really like that. I feel like it's a lot more usable now. You also have an option that you can enable to show the pattern play progress. So if I enable it and I hold the pattern, you can see the, the bar right here that tells you where you are in the pattern. So this is great. Another thing they added is uh, we used to have the ability to just drag and drop the different chord pads into our project. So I can either uh, drop them on the chord track or I can drag them on an instrument or MIDI track to have the MIDI file. Now we also have the option to use uh, what they call step input. So if I enable this, I can set the start position and I can just click on the different chords and add them just like that according to the snapping interval that I have in my project. We also made some change to the import track archive, import and export, but also the import track from project. So let's just say we would like to import some track archive. So the way to export them is you go under export, selected track. So if I want to export, let's say this track, I can just go under file, export, selected track, copy media file, and select the folder to export it. Let's do this really quickly. Um, let's add a folder 
and export this track. So now if I want to re-import it, I go under File, Import, Track Archive, if I just want to export this specific track, and it's right there. It's an XML file, and if I double-click on it, this window is a, a redesign window. It kind of looks like the import track from project now, but you can select different options like where you want to import this track uh, to a new track or to an existing one. You can try to make it match the naming if there's already a track with the same name here. That's really useful if, let's say, you have a template that you design, you're recording an album, you're in the studio, you recorded some drums with 14 microphone, you create a new project and you'd like to import those same tracks, you can quickly do that there. And you also now have an option to import a specific range. So you can uh, set it manually or use your current locators to set it. So if I use locators, it's just going to import this track, but the portion that is between those locators, we can also decide if we want to import it right below the selected track or at the bottom of the track list. We also see the project settings over there. Uh, we can copy the active project folder as well. So it is a good improvement. Now, just to compare, let's open the import track from project. Let me just grab a random project. As you can see, I have a lot more stuff in that project, but it's the same window basically with the same function. So I can select the range, I can decide where I want to import it and so on. Uh, keep in mind that you also have options for absolute position, relative position or cursor position. So let's say you want to import some tracks from a project, but at the cursor, you can do that easily now. They improved a lot of small windows, pop-up windows and things like that. They expanded on different things. Like let's say you would like to rename that event. You can press F2 and a window pops up. You can just rename it really quickly. So let's say I rename it SFX press enter and it's as easy as that. The same goes for when you create a new track. There are now new options if you want depending on the type of tracks that you want to create. We have the configuration, but we can also now assign audio inputs that are instrument outputs or a sampler track outputs. So usually when you wanted to record, let's say a VSTI that you had a synth and you wanted to re-record it onto an audio track, you had to jump through a bunch of hoops now it's super easy to do when you create a new audio track, you have the option to select the output of your instrument or sampler track. So I can select Lush. I have Lush loaded right now in this project. And if I enable monitoring and I go play some notes inside of Lush, it's coming right into the input of that track. So I could just press record and record it as an audio file. Another cool thing that they changed in terms of windows is if you go under edit key commands, changing and customizing your key commands is something that is really important in my opinion. And this window really needed a redesign. So now when you search for specific function, let's say tap tempo, there's no more browsing through the different options and the window was ugly. Now it filters it like it does for plugins and other windows. It's super easy to see the key that is assigned to it to assign a new one. We also have, let's say you want to know what function is associated with a keyboard shortcut. You can press this small button right there. Let's say I click now on control C it's gonna bring me to the copy so I can delete it, add new keyboard shortcut to it or whatever. And you can also filter by uh, functions that already have a keyboard shortcut assigned, the ones that I customize myself or the ones that don't have any keyboard shortcut assigned. Another really good thing is under macros, let's say you created a new macro, you used to have to create the macro then find it in this window over here and assign it a keyboard shortcut. So now you can just click this field to assign a keyboard shortcut. So I just press the keyboard shortcut and I can click assign. So they tweak a bunch of other smaller windows like the missing file window. Let's say you open an old project and it can't find the files. It's not a lot better. And a bunch of tiny windows like that. It just feels a lot more modern and usable. Speaking of modern and usable, we now have a tap 
tempo button right there in the transport panel. So if I want to detect a tempo, I used to have to go under the project tab and have the beat detector window pop up thing. Now I can just click on the tap tempo to quickly detect the tempo and you can always assign a keyboard shortcut to it. So right now I have shift and space bar assigned. So if I click that keyboard shortcut, I can use that tap tempo. Now, if we look at the video track, if you upgrade to Cubase 13 and you're on Windows, they updated the video engine. It's a lot better now. It's, it's not using OpenGL and it feels great. It's snappier. It deals way better with different resolution. You can resize it without having some janky stuff happening in the background. So this is great. Uh, but they also added the ability to have track version on a video track. So this is really good if you're mixing or working on a video. Let's say your client sends you a different version of the same video. You can quickly either use the inspector uh, under the track version tab to add ones, duplicate this one or add your new video to a new one, let's say navigate through the different version of the video. Or if you prefer, you can always use the uh, naming field under the track itself and switch between the different versions. You also have other options to create new ones, duplicate, rename, delete them, or select track with the same version ID. So this is great. I feel like it's gonna help a lot of people that are working on mixing content on videos. Another big thing that they added that you might not find useful right now is MIDI 2.0. We've been using MIDI 1.0 for such a long time and it really needed a refresh in my opinion, but they also needed to make sure that it's backward compatible. So what they did in MIDI 2.0 is they increased the precision quite a lot. So let's say for velocity, we can go from zero to 127, but with MIDI 2.0, we have the same, but they added three decimals. So instead of being between zero and 127, it's between zero and 127,000. So it adds a lot of precision. The same goes for MIDI groups. We used to be able to have a 16 different MIDI channels and we now have 256 MIDI channel. And to keep backward compatibility, they divided into 16 groups of 16 channel to make sure that if you open an old project, everything is gonna be backward compatible between MIDI 1.0 and 2.0. There's a lot more information online if you want. You can always Google MIDI 2.0, but it's really cool to see that Steinberg is always looking towards the future and adapting to those new technologies. Speaking of MIDI, let's open this MIDI editor as a full window. One really good thing they added is the ability to use the range selection to do a bunch of different things. So editing MIDI notes now, it's super easy using the range selection. So if I want to just delete a specific portion of it, even if I want to, let's say, quantize some specific notes, like this one, I just select it, click quantize. So instead of using the regular object selection tool, you can now use this to improve your workflow. And it's also possible to use it in the lower section under CC or velocity or whatever this window is for you. Uh, so you can select a specific range and compress it, change the volume, tilt it, all of the good features that we used to have, but with now the range selection tool. As you might have noticed, we now have a visibility tab right there. And we also have some other weird things happening on the top bar. So let's say I enable the MIDI 01 track as well. As you can see, we now have different selection on top. It is a new workflow for the MIDI editor and I really like it. So it allows you to edit all of the MIDI tracks at once or just focus on the selected one, but you don't have to go back to the project window to select a new MIDI event to go edit it. You can quickly navigate through it either by selecting it in the upper part right there or by browsing through them over here and enabling the visibility if you don't want to have them. Let's say I just want to tweak the Lush one. I can just enable Lush if I want to have both. And you also have different options on what happens when you edit them. So. Right now, if I select all of the notes, it's gonna select everything on all the MIDI tracks. 
But if I go over here on the part editing mode, I can change that. So right now it's set to all parts. If I set it to active part only, I'm only gonna be able to edit and select the one under the event that I have selected up there. So if I try to select them all, it's only gonna select this one. The same goes for if I switch. And if I go to the other track, same thing happens. And I can also change it to all part on the active track. So let's say I go back to this one. Now I can select both of them, uh, but they have to be on the same track. So this is really useful, especially if you have a big project with a lot of MIDI tracks and you don't want to always go back and forth to select them in the project window. You can now quickly toggle between them. And if you don't like that, you hide them. Problem solved. One really good addition, in my opinion, is if you go under the transport menu in the top bar, we now have an option called start mode. So we can change the way that we start the project when we press play or if we press the space bar. So if we select start from project cursor position, this is the usual one where if I press play, it's going to start from where the cursor is. Now, if I go back to this menu, we now have start from cycle start. So let's say I have a cycle over here. The cursor is here. I press play. It directly goes to this cycle. We also have another option, and this is my favorite one. Start from selection start. So if I want to hear specific events, I just select it, press play, and it start right at the start of the event. It's super fast as well. It's great for listening to the different events quickly. I really like that. Uh, I feel like I'm going to use this mode quite a lot. And the other one is start from selection or cycle start. So it combines those two options. You always have the return to start position on stop. This is my preferred setting, but if you want to change it, you can. Basically, if I put my cursor there, I press play when I stop it goes back there, but if I change it, now it's gonna keep the active position when I press stop. So this option was already in the settings, but it's now under that menu, which is a lot more accessible. Now, if you take a look at the marker track, one of the really good improvement that they added is a way to quickly add a marker and rename it right away. So if we use those buttons, we can just hold the shift button. So if I hold shift and I click the add marker, it adds the marker, but it also asks me to give it a name. So I can say, let's say intro. Let's say I want to add a loop marker. Um, I could go here, hold shift, add the loop marker, and it, it's asking me a name. So I could say chorus. And the same goes with obviously the modifiers. So if I hold shift and control, I can create a loop marker just like that. And it's asking me to rename it right away. So I could say, let's say bridge. And if I hold alt and shift, it's the same as clicking shift and clicking on the add a single marker there. It's asking me to rename it right away. So it's a lot easier. Let's say I have the outro over here. I want a loop section. I hold control and shift let it go and already have a name for it right away. It's uh, quite useful in my opinion. I really like how we navigate inside of Cubase. You can use the mouse wheel and hold shift to navigate left and right. If you want to zoom in, you can hold control and zoom in with the mouse wheel. You can also zoom in horizontally with this section right there. If you hold the left mouse button in the ruler and you drag down or up, you can zoom in. You can use H and G as well to zoom in and out. But it was a bit clunky when it came to zoom in vertically. You had to go here and tweak this to try to enlarge the tracks vertically. Now they added a keyboard modifier for that and it's shift control with the mouse wheel button and you can easily zoom. So it's a lot easier. Let's say I want to work on this section. I zoom in vertically and horizontally and it's great. They added something similar for the waveform zoom. So usually we had to go here. So let's say I select this. 
I zoom in and we can see that the waveform is zoomed in. It's useful when you have a really quiet recording and you want to see the waveform. But now if you click on Control and Alt and you use the mouse wheel, you can quickly zoom the waveform in and out. Now let's take a look at the sampler track. So let me just open the lower window and go under the sampler control, drag and drop this wave file to create a sampler track. We now have more options in the sampler track. So the first thing they added is if you enable audio warp, usually if you use your MIDI controller, you can play the different sample to different pitch. So now I have a, a vocal chop. So if I play it in a higher pitch, it plays faster and lower pitch. It plays slower and it kind of sounds like an elephant or a dinosaur. Uh, but if you want to prevent that, the fact that it plays slower, we can use audio warp and we already had the music and solo mode. So let me just show you the musical mode. Uh, if we play it slower or lower pitch, it keeps the same speed, but it just tried to pitch it down. Same thing for higher pitch. And depending on the mode that you select, it's going to have different qualities or artifacts to it. So let's try solo. Solo might be a bit better since it's a solo instrument. Now let's try the new modes. They added spectral, spectral HD, and spectral vocal. So let's hear what they sound like. That's pretty good. That's actually really good. Uh, let's try the spectral HD. This is pretty clean. Uh, now let's try vocal. Uh, it's supposed to be good for this specific case. Wow. This is probably the, the best algorithm for that kind of stuff. They also added way more option to the modulation section. So it's available in every section that has mod. So filter, amp, or pitch and it's drawing tools with different shapes and it's actually really good so you have the regular edit mode where you can add some dots or tweak the existing dots around you can erase them but now you have a draw tool and a paint tool so let's try the draw tool and let's select a ramp shape so if i drag it from here it's going to start the ramp shape from here and i can make it either go up or down and i can select the range so if I let it go and I apply some amount, so this is the envelope on the pitch of the sample. So let's listen to it. So it's pitching it according to the shape that I put. Uh, so I can add as many as I want and I can have different shapes. So let's say I do this right here. That's great, but let's say I want the pattern to repeat itself instead. I could use the paint brush tool instead. So if I hold it, I can just create a pattern and change it, but it's always going to have the same gap between the different patterns. So now let's press play. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's super easy to do. It's quite intuitive since we're used to uh, dealing with different shapes and draw tools. Uh, we now have under the spectral modes options for tweaking format and having format shift key follow. So uh, the format will change depending on where you are on your keyboard. If you play a higher note, it's going to apply more format shift. So these are really good mode for sound designers specifically. Now, one feature request I've been seeing for probably over 10 years on the Steinberg forum is the ability to change tracks from mono to stereo and vice versa. It's now in Cubase 13. I never thought I would say that, uh, but it's this little button right there. I can easily switch from stereo to mono. It's also over here on the channel zone if I want. And obviously, if I open the uh, mix console, it's there as well. So I can 
quickly change between mono and stereo directly on the tracks. It also works for FX tracks and group tracks. So if I add an FX track, just like that, I can switch it to mono or stereo. So if you had, let's say, a mono FX by mistake, you want to have a stereo delay, it's now super easy to toggle it. And the same goes for the group track. Let's add one. It's right there. Amazing addition. A lot of people will be happy about that, I'm, I'm sure. Now let's take a look at some of the new plugins. The first one is called Vocal Chain and it's an amazing vocal multi-effect. It's targeted really towards mixing vocals and it's great. It includes three sections. We have a clean section, a character section and a send section. So under clean, we have cut filter, a gate, some pitch manipulation, de a dynamic filter, a compressor, and an EQ. Uh, we can rearrange them. So if I want the gate to be the first one, I can really easily drag and drop them. I can solo the different modules, bypass them if needed. And now under the character portion right here, we have an exciter, a saturator, another compressor, a dynamic filter, another EQ, because sometimes when we excite and we saturate, we want to EQ it after another DSR for the same reasons. And the last section, the send section, we have an imager with some formant stuff, a delay and some reverb. So you have basically everything you need to make your vocal sounds amazing. If you want to have an overview of all the modules, you can click on overview and have some basic settings over there. I can also focus on the clean section and have uh, settings for all of them right there. Same for character and send. I feel like visually it looks really good and it's super easy to understand. So if you were considering maybe buying something like Nectar, well, you should give it a shot because it's a really good multi-effect plugin targeted at vocals specifically. Now, Vocoder is also another new plugin. I think it was an existing plugin that they revamped and brought back. I think it was there in an old version of Cubase, but I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm, I think I remember this, but it is a great vocoder. It's really usable and Obviously, the UI looks modern. It's quite simple, yet powerful enough to use as a good vocoder. Another plugin they added is called Black Valve. It's a compressor, but it emulates old school tube compressors. So we can think about the Fairchild, for example, with a really vintage sound to it. These are slower compressors, but they're really musically appealing in my opinion. So make sure to give it a shot. Maybe put it on your master or something like that, or on some groups. They also added a plugin called Vox Comp. It really reminds me of RVox from Waves. It's a simple plugin to use since you only have one knob. So let's say I press play here. Day after, day after. I can easily tweak the compression level just with one knob, but they also added a dry wet. So if I want to smash the vocals, but keep some of the dry signal, I can easily day do that. After, day after. It is great. Those two plugins might look familiar to you. Obviously they are emulation of the old school pull tech. These are really musical to my ear. I use them on vocals quite a lot. These are great for different thing. You also have a little trick where you can boost and attenuate the same frequency at once and it does something magical on bass. So you can look it up online, uh, but this is a really good addition in my opinion. Another plugin they added, it's not as fun, but it's really useful in my opinion. And it's the test generator. Now it will generate different kind of, let's say sine, uh, triangle, square, sawtooth, and it will do sweeps. You have sweep options, so you can decide the start frequency and the end frequency and the duration. So this is really good for recording impulse response if you need it. They also have white noise, pink noise, brown noise, blue noise, gray noise, and violet noise. So I calibrated my studio quite often. Every time that I move some stuff around, I want to recalibrate it afterwards. And I'm always struggling to find a good test generator. And this one is really good. You can switch between the RMS and the peak value. You have so many options, both for different signs, 
noises or sweeps and you also have some other gain settings if you need that really good test generator i'm quite happy about it because even if it's not as fun as a shiny new plugin for mixing vocals for example uh, this is really great for calibration needs and impulse response recording now, when it comes to the content that comes with Cubase Pro 13, here on the left, we have Cubase Pro 12. So starting from Verve, you can see uh, the bundles that were included in Cubase Pro 13. We have quite a lot. Now, keep in mind, this is zoomed in more than this window, but we have Analog Wonder, Cinematic Electronic, Content Set. You can pause uh, the video if you want and look at all of them, or you can go on their website and find that information, but they added a bunch of bundles or expansion that comes free with Cubase Pro 13. So this is always appreciated. So I hope you enjoyed that video. As usual, if you liked it, click the like button and subscribe and let me know in the comments below if you like that upgrade, or what are the most interesting features for you. And as usual, I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.